Hi, I'm Bob Hanlon. If you took a sphere about the size made of metal, heated it up to a really high temperature and dropped it in a bucket of cold water, you could predict how the temperature would change in that metal from the surface of the sphere all the way to the inside and determine how long it would take to cool off. The reason you can do that is you have mathematics available to you provided by one Joseph Fourier. Back in the early 1800s, Fourier wrote a book on the analytical theory of heat. This was back in 1822. They gave the mathematics on how to predict the change in temperature of a body due to a change in its environment. A simple form of the mathematics that he worked with are shown here. And what I'm showing here is the, the change in temperature of the body as a function of the position x in the body as a function of time is related to the gradient, the temperature gradient in that body. It's a second derivative of temperature with, with regards to location. With that equation, you could apply it to a sphere this size, or you could also apply it to a sphere this size. The equation is scalable in that way. Now, one of the uses of Fourier's mathematics is you can apply it to a sphere like that and predict the future. Here I show how you do that. You put in what your initial conditions are for the sphere. You put in a fixed amount of time into the future you want to predict. You put it through his equation, and then you can predict what that temperature profile is going to be. Very powerful means to predict the future. But you can also predict the past, and that's where it gets fascinating. In here, you put in a profile of an existing sphere or object that you're looking at, or an, an existing temperature profile. You Assume what the conditions were at the beginning of the whole process, put it through his equation here, and then you can predict the time in the past when the project or process began. And that will tell you the age of the process. Now what's the importance of that? Well, back in the mid-1800s, someone took that equation and did that exact process to calculate the age of the Earth fascinating calculation that was done and I want to tell you about that. The person who did the calculation was William Thompson. William Thompson, he, shown here, he was an early founder of thermodynamics. He had a great working partnership with James Joule and that gets into another video that I'm working on about the Joule Thompson uh, effect. But he became, because of the amount of contributions he made to, to British science, he became Lord Kelvin in 1892. Now, William Thompson was also a math whiz at a young age, and he mastered Fourier's mathematics by the time he was 16 years old. And from what I understand and read, he did that in a matter of weeks. So what did Thompson do with regards to the age of the Earth? Let's look at that. Let's look at the assumptions. Thompson assumed that the Earth started as a molten sphere that slowly solidified from the inside out. He assumed that it was about 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm showing that here on the, the temperature axis. And then he said that at, at a certain point, the entire Earth, when it finally solidified, the whole temperature was uniformly 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And then he said at time equals zero, he set the surface of the Earth equal to zero degree Fahrenheit, shown here. And that was when the Earth started to cool, and he wanted to look at that cooling process. So the cooling process happen from the outside in. You can see these temperature profiles with increasing time here showing how the surface of the earth was predicted to cool over time. So to Thompson, with these initial conditions, he said, Which, where are we right now with these curves? What is the gradient of temperature with respect to the radius of the earth here that we're on? What path are we, are we on? And thus, if I know that path, I know what time set that curve there and I would know the age of the earth. What a fascinating set of assumptions that he did with that. So here is a zoom in on what he did. So again we have the temperature here, 7000 degree F was the starting point, 0 degree F was the surface of the earth that he assumed, and here is the radius of the earth here. And what he did was he said here is the the slope, the curve there, and what we need is a data point on that curve to fix the curve. Now, 
Thompson, as well as everybody else, knew that as you went deeper into the earth from the surface, either through deep mining or uh, digging a well out, the temperature of the earth increased. Thompson urged the determination of how much it increased with depth, knowing that that would help with his mathematics here. And what he found was this. If you went 50 feet down into the earth, obviously this is not drawn to scale, but if you went 50 feet down into the earth, the temperature rose by one degree Fahrenheit. And he said, okay, at the surface of the earth, which is where, frankly, all of the change was really happening, one degree Fahrenheit increase per, per 50 degree depth. He put that into his mathematics and he determined that the earth was 100 million years old. What a fascinating calculation that was to determine that. Also, just for a, a, a point of trivia here, he also said that once you get to about a, a hundred miles into the earth here, you're up at the 7,000 degree Fahrenheit point. Very interesting. But the key gist of all of this was the fact that he estimated the age of the earth to be 100 million years. And this was in 1862 that he did the mathematics. What was the point of him doing that? What was his motivation? Well, the first motivation had to do with the geologists of the time and their belief in a very long word called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. Wow, that's a mouthful. Well, and what the geologists assumed was that the earth was uniform for a very long time, meaning that the way that it existed today was the way that it existed in the past, going back many, many years. And this was captured in a, a quote by a, a Scottish geologist, uh, James Hutton, basically saying that the belief of geologists was no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Again, the earth was uniform over a long time. William Thompson looked at that and said, this, this is not true. This violates the laws of thermodynamics. What he said was that the earth cannot be at steady state because you have a gradient in the earth of temperature, you have to have a heat flux. He believed that energy dissipates. This is his dissipation theory of energy, similar to Clausius's theory of entropy. But he said that if energy dissipates, eventually the whole earth will cool off over a long enough time down to zero. This gets into an early form of the second law of thermodynamics that a gradient dissipates over time, or as Clausius said, the entropy of an isolated system increases over time. This was the original approach that William Thompson took to attack the geologists, but indirectly he was attacking another concept at the time. Again, we wonder why did he do the calculation in 1862? Well, historians believe that he did that calculation for this reason. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote a book called On the Origin of Species. And in that book, Darwin proposed the concept of natural selection. And he also said that much more time than 100 million years would be required for his evolutionary process to have resulted in where we are today. Well, Calvin rejected the concept of natural selection. He believed in an intelligent design, and with an intelligent design, a much shorter time was required to get where we are today. And this was the logic behind William Thompson putting forth his calculation in 1863 to provide evidence that the earth couldn't be as old as what Darwin thought. Crosby Smith, a historian on William Thompson or Lord Calvin, wrote this about Calvin. He said, Calvin's use of the new thermodynamics would police geological and biological theorizing in general and undermine Darwin's doctrine of natural selection in particular. This quote is from a very good book that Crosby Smith wrote on the science of energy and it concerns the uh, career of William Thompson or Lord Calvin in this critical time of energy and the discovery of energy in the mid 1800s. So what was the impact, the final impact of all of this? Well, the first thing was William Thompson forced the geologists to take notice to the use of physics to calculate such things as the age of the earth. It had a, had a tremendous effect on the geologists of the day. Also, 
Calvin won the battle temporarily in the mid-1800s. His calculations stood firm. But Darwin eventually won the war. You see, the age of the Earth is more like 4.5 billion years, much greater than 100 million years. And some of the errors in Calvin's calculation, William Thompson's calculation, concerned the fact that he assumed that there was no heat source generating heat in the center of the Earth, whereas later people discovered the concept of radioactivity and radioactive decay, which could generate heat in the internal source, and that's what was happening in the Earth. There were some other challenges to his assumptions, and I don't want to get into that now, but this is what the impact was. It was a very positive impact because it raised the discussion to a much higher level. My final thought on all of this is, if you'll excuse the expression, wow. Thompson estimated the Earth's age from a very seemingly simple equation. Obviously, it was complicated, but it was a simple equation with a single data point, one degree F temperature rise per 50 feet depth. And from that, he calculated an age of the Earth of 100 million years. I'm amazed at the, the, the seeming simplicity of that calculation and the impact that it had. Thank you very much for listening to this short thermodynamics story uh, about a very in interesting time in the therm history of thermodynamics. Look forward to talking with you in about a month or so. Hope to share with you some results on our work with regards to the Joule-Thompson effect. Until then, goodbye.